Ours, the cross, the grave, and the skies. It wasn't just Jesus who went through those things. When you put your faith in Him, we go through all of those things together. We take on His life, His death, His resurrection, His mission, His sufferings, His inheritance, and His privileges. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Verse 14 again. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. It wasn't just Jesus who was raised. We will be raised also. His resurrection is our resurrection. I know a lot of you out there are, are Detroit Lions fans. When you're watching, when you're watching the Lions and, and you're rooting for them and, and they, they score a touchdown, you cheer, right? But it wasn't you that scored the touchdown. You're, you're not on the team. But you share in that victory. When they, when they win... Their, their victory is, is your victory, and, and usually you say, we won. The same way, when Jesus rose from the dead, that resurrection is our resurrection. His victory is our victory. We celebrate that even though we have not yet resurrected from the dead, because his resurrection is ours. So let's look at Jesus a minute. His grave was empty. When those women went there on that first Easter morning and they found the tomb, there was no body there. The stone was rolled away, but there was no body. His grave was empty. There's a picture there. This is is how they secured his, his tomb. The Pharisees thought, you know what? This this man Jesus. That, that we didn't like. He said he was going to rise again, so maybe his disciples will come and try to take the body and then tell everybody that he was raised from the dead. We, we can't let that happen, so let's, let's make that tomb secure as much as we can, and let's post a guard, and they put that seal right there so that if that stone gets moved, they will definitely know. And so they secured that tomb. Well, of course, we know the end of that story. They couldn't keep him in there. There's some people who are out there who would say that his body was just stolen and that's why the tomb was empty. There's some skeptics out there who would say that, but, but how would his body be stolen in that environment? Let alone by just some women and some fishermen. How would they get past some trained soldiers 
and a Roman seal like that. There's some skeptics who say that they, maybe the women went to the wrong tomb. But how many tombs are sealed like this and have a guard posted on them like that? How could you miss that one? It doesn't really add up very well. His grave was empty. We were confident of that. And he, he left his grave clothes behind, it says. The text gives impression that his grave clothes were kind of left in some sort of collapsed shell, maybe something like that. You know, usually we have these pictures of these clothes, you know, draped on the ground and stuff like that. And, you know, that's, that's fine for the effect of it. But if you were walking into that tomb, the way that, the way that it's described here, especially in John, it says Peter saw the strips of linen lying there. Like, like it was almost like in a shape of a body that was lying down. As well as the burial cloth or the face cloth that had been around Jesus' head. It says the cloth was folded up or rolled up or wrapped together, it says in the King James, by itself, separate from the linen. So it's almost like, it's almost like Jesus' body just kind of disappeared from underneath those clothes and then could reappear elsewhere. He left those grave clothes behind. There's some skeptics out there who say, well, maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Maybe he just passed out. But he left the grave clothes behind. If he just passed out somehow, let's just say this, how could he leave the grave clothes behind? That doesn't make any sense. If the body was stolen, why would they leave the grave clothes behind? If you were going to take a body and you wanted to get away with this and not be seen by anybody, you wouldn't bother taking grave clothes off. You'd just grab the body and get out of there. The grave clothes were left behind. And he rose with a different body, a new and improved body. It was the same body, but it was new and improved. He was not a ghost. You can't, can't get this wrong. It wasn't like Jesus just raised as a spirit. His body rose. They, they touched him. And, and the Bible goes to great lengths to say, no, he, he had an actual body. We touched that body. So in Luke 24, it says, He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. Jesus actually said to them, Go ahead, touch me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And I like the way that First John begins. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. We touched him. We were not just seeing some sort of vision or anything like that. This wasn't a hallucination. We touched him. And this body that was risen was a body that could do things that his other body couldn't. It was, a, it was a pretty incredible body that he had. He could walk through walls. He could kind of appear and disappear at will. He ascended into heaven. And he could be unrecognizable and then recognizable at different times. It was, it was, a, it was a new body, a new and improved body. So his grave clothes were left behind, his grave was empty, his body was new and improved. His curse was reversed. The cross is empty. We have a cross up here. There's nobody on that cross. The cross is empty. The grave is empty. This cross that should have shamed him actually glorified him. 
The cross is designed to shame you and to put you down, to defeat you, and it didn't work. The resurrection reversed it all. The cross should have killed him. Instead, it gave him life. What should have proved him wrong ended up proving him right. What should have ended his following actually began his following. We celebrate the cross today. What should have beat him made him unbeatable. His curse was reversed. Everything that the cross was designed to do to him was turned on its head. And this is something you even celebrate today. So he died already. He can't die again. He already did that. Romans 6 verse 9. This is on the screen. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. So what should have ended him actually began him. He, he also defeated Satan. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, it says in Hebrews, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So he liberated all of us. In Revelation 19, Jesus is going to return, and he's going to return as a conquering hero on a white horse. And he's going to win the world. The end of the story is already written now. When he rose from the dead, it means the end of the story is already written. It's done. It's going to happen. It's only a matter of time. In Genesis, it talks about, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head. You will strike at his heel. The serpent's head is crushed. So if you light a fuse, it's only a matter of time before the bomb goes off. If you lay a train track, and the train is on that track, it's only a matter of time before the train ends up where the track is laid. The end of the story is already written. It's only a matter of time before all things are completed, all things are made new, and that final victory is ours. The track is laid. It's going to happen. Some people compare the resurrection to, to D-Day, if you're into history, in World War II, that that was D-Day, and, and now it's going to be... This is more like Berlin just fell. And now all we have left is Japan. It's only a matter of time. It's going to happen. So, if this was the Super Bowl, it would be as if this was, it was 60 to nothing and there's only three minutes left. It's only a matter of time. It's not like New England can come back somehow and still win. Not like that. No. No, it's 60 to nothing, and there is only three minutes left. It's only a matter of time. The winner is clear. In basketball, when you're running out of time and the, the score is, the other team is too far ahead, what do you do? You, you try to just foul the other person to get the t clock to stop, right? Satan can't win the game. He can only stop the clock now. He can only try to foul us try to stall. But the end is inevitable. When Jesus rose from the dead, that was it. As sure as the sun rises and sets, Christ is risen and he will return again and every knee is going to bow before him when he appears on that last day. Look at the screen here with me, if you would, and let's answer this question together. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he won for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already now resurrected 
to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our glorious resurrection. This is not just His resurrection, this is ours too. It's not just His victory, it's our victory too. So for us, for me, His grave is empty. That means my grave one day will be empty too. His grave was empty, my grave will be empty. And this is not just for believers. Some, some things about Christ only apply to, to people who believe. This one is going to apply to anybody, no matter what they believe. Absolutely every grave in this world is going to be empty at some day. When Christ comes again, all the people are going to rise from their graves. Everybody. Every last person. We're not going to be able to escape the end, the inevitable. When Christ defeated death, he defeated death for everybody. Everybody is going to come out of their graves, no matter what. So like, if you, you know how when you pop a balloon, it just kind of explodes. It's no longer there. When Christ rose from the dead, it's kind of like popping that balloon from the inside. So Jesus died, and he was part of death, but he popped the balloon, and now everybody is loose. So our graves are going to be empty. Death, death is just a temporary thing now. He left his grave clothes. That means I can't take things into eternity, not even the clothes on my back, even, even the clothes that we're wearing, can't take them into eternity. There's this world and there's the next world. And we are going to continue into that world. But everything of this world, everything else that's not me, is going to be left here. And that's why it says in verse 18, what we read today, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. It's gonna... (laughs) It's not going to last. But what is unseen is eternal. Those are the things that we concentrate on. So, we need to focus on what we can't see. The things that really matter are not the things that we can quantify today very well. We need to remember that. Concentrate on what you can't see. His body was made new. It means my body will be made new. There's not going to be any more sickness. There's not going to be any more decay. There's not going to be any more aches and pains. There's going to be no more aging. There's going to be no more handicaps, no more disabilities. None of those bodily problems that we have anymore, that's going to be gone. It says in Philippians 3, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. So our bodies are going to be transformed to be like His. And all that cool stuff that He could do, who knows, maybe we'll be able to do that stuff too. Who knows what kind of capacities these new bodies will have? The sky's the limit. And, and that's not just his body. These will be our bodies too. But instead, instead of what all that cool stuff that we might be able to do, then the, the best thing about these new bodies is that we are going to have eyes to see the Savior who redeemed us. We're going to have hands that can touch him. We're going to have arms that we can throw around him and hug him. We're going to have fingers where we can touch those nail marks ourselves, just like Thomas did. We'll be able to do that. 
We'll be able to touch him. Seeing our Savior is going to beat anything else that this world has to offer. And in him, adversity brings victory. Verses 8 and 9 of what we read. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Adversity is not just adversity, it actually brings us victory now. This is, this is the strange logic of Christ. His whole life and death and resurrection change things. So that even the problems that we have, the adversity that we have, is changed. Worldly defeat in the logic of Jesus means heavenly victory. Earthly death means everlasting life. And temporal surrender means eternal gain. So Jesus surrendered himself to the Father's will and the eternal gain that he had. He died an earthly death and now he has an everlasting life. And he was defeated by all of the world's standards. But now his victory is beyond anything that we can comprehend. That applies to us too. The adversity that we face, the problems that we have, these difficulties that we have, can be our victories, our glory. With my eternity secure, there's nothing to fear. That's something we need to keep in mind. When our eternity is secure, we have nothing to fear. I mean, that doesn't mean we're not going to be afraid. Because there are some pretty scary things out there for sure. But if the eternity is secure, if, if the end is in stone, we don't have any real things to be afraid of. Romans 8, this is a passage that many of you are familiar with. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? What? What could possibly do it? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because of Jesus Christ, we are actually conquerors through these things, these adversities, these problems. And these things, we don't know what famine is or nakedness is these are some pretty scary things. And we are more than conquerors in these things. It's easy for us to get defeated when we face adversity. It's easy for us to get discouraged. It's easy for us to despair, to get pessimistic and feel like, oh, that's it. No. Jesus rose from the dead we, we are more than conquerors in these things. This is, this is as it says in, in our passage today, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. When you go through some problems, when you have some adversity, when you get discouraged, remember this. This is not the end. This is not a time to despair. This is not for discouragement. This is achieving for you a glory that far outweighs anything that you're facing. No matter what happens to you, and no matter how bad it gets, one day you're going to look back on it and say, totally worth it. Totally worth it. Because what it earned far outweighs anything that you went through. Let's not get discouraged, people. Let's not despair. We are more than conquerors in these things because Christ rose from the dead. So we might lose a lot in this life. We might lose everything. 
Who knows? But our eternity is written on stone in heaven, and what is there is going to far outweigh anything else that we could possibly lose here. And the end of my story, the end of our story, is unending joy with Jesus. It's really hard to find a picture that can kind of capture this. This was like the closest that I could come. Unending joy with Jesus. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Unending joy with Jesus is going to far outweigh anything else that happens here. No matter what happens. You know how we enjoy seeing family and friends. We enjoy their company. We we enjoy that because... We share love together. There's people that we like to be around because, because we love each other. And, and there's a, a joy that comes from that, right? So on holidays and such, we get together with family. On birthdays, we get together with family and, and that. And there's, there's joy in that because we love each other. We're fond of each other because of that. What do you think the love is going to be like the love of Jesus. If this is how we feel about earthly love, if this is the joy that we have in earthly love, what is it going to be like when we have heavenly love? If you think about how much you love your family and how much maybe you love being around them, your friends and such, think about how much greater it's going to be when you experience the love of Jesus. That's heavenly love. That's perfect love. Unending joy with Jesus. The love we cherish now is only a whiff of the love of Jesus that we are going to experience in eternity that's going to far outweigh anything else that we have here. We'll experience love in the truest sense, and that's from Jesus. And all of this is ours because Christ rose from the dead. His story is our story. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord, our God in heaven, how great is your love towards us that we should be able to share in our Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection, his victory. What an amazing privilege it is, Lord. We pray that we would keep our eyes set on these things. That, Lord, whatever happens here between now and then, that we would not get discouraged, but that, Lord, we would be uplifted because of what is coming. Lord, keep us rooted in that. We pray all things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.